quite a bit. Triple negative breast cancer. What do women need to know? Well, um, locally, it only accounts for about 15 to 20 percent of breast cancers that we diagnose, and um, it's usually considered to be a more aggressive type of breast cancer, and that is questionable because since we don't have any specific target therapy for it, most think that it's because of its biology, that it's not necessarily more aggressive, and it's just the fact that we don't have a specific target to tackle it, okay? But for the most part, it is the most aggressive type of breast cancer, and we have a higher prevalence in African-American women and within African-American women, younger women. And I know we have some questions on the line pertaining to that, and we don't really know why that is, except for the issues that we're getting into ancestry and genetic makeup. But so far, that's, uh, that's a kind of the input of the triple negative. So do we know, it sounds like, because my next question was going to be about why it seems to be affecting the African-American race. Do you have any insight we, on we why really it's too, don't know that. It's we too don't premature? Know that. Okay. We don't know that. You know, you have to understand also that this has been brewing, all these biologic issues have been brewing probably over the past 60 years when they first started to publish that indeed there were different subtypes of breast cancer. And, uh, you know, the luminal A with the luminal B, the triple negative, there's another one called the HER2 type, and then the, the triple negative, which is known also as the basal type. But since then, over the past 60 years, we've really been learning more about even different biologic differences within the triple negatives. And around now, there's at least seven subtypes of the triple negative. So even within what's called triple negative, there's differences that we cannot really explain. But we really see different behaviors in different tumors that are triple negative. So some do well with treatment and some don't have any response to treatment at all. And we, and we cannot fix. So that's a challenge. There's different substances in the triple negative. You're, you're cutting out a little bit, Dr. Mendez. Oh, uh, hold on. Yes, okay. hold on, because I'm in movement. One second. Is it better now? Yeah, we hear you now. Much better. Perfect. So, so to recap, so there's different subtypes, even with the triple negative. And we don't really know within those triple negatives right now which ones are going to be the ones responding and which are just going to be the ones that if we expect it, what we do, they will not have a response, a response. So that's a challenge. Interesting. Do you think that there's misconceptions around this triple negative breast absolutely cancer? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We just have lack of information. You know, okay. biology is at the crux of the matter. And obviously we have really unraveled a lot of that biology over the past 16 years. So there's still a lot that we don't know. Uh, yes, I guess farther down we'll talk about we know that there's an association between some of the RCA1 mutation and, and triple negative breast cancer, and we try to see what is the mechanism of action in the BRCA gene to see if we can then find a target. You know, we've got all sorts of different strategies to find that target, but today we don't have anything that we can offer by tons of research. So that's considered the holy grail to breast cancer, the triple negative. Do you think, um, you know, there's so many preventative measures, whether it's getting a mammogram, um, you know, things that you can do for even other types of cancers. Do you think that... Well, it, it is it's all applicable the same. Okay. You know, it's no different in terms of how you diagnose it, in terms of how you find it, there's nothing special to it. So the but same, the same thing. At the level thing, of the histology. So if, there, if there's yeah. a woman that's at risk for triple negative breast cancer, well, you're... We, you cannot say that, you know, because it's not a secure risk for triple negative breast cancer. You know, African American women get uh, normal cancer care. They don't have okay. to be triple negative. You know, so I think the point that to be made is 
that, you know, you can just tell the difference on imaging. If you see the triple negative where it's in here, you have the picture, you cannot say that this is sort of the level of what this other method so, so we have no way of knowing. So it's the same preventative measures, and it's not... Absolutely. Yeah. But this is in a very interesting issue, because all, obviously most of the breast cancers are what we call hormonally sensitive. And they're responsible for the progesterone. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. It's a little so, bit more muffled, but we can hear you. Okay. So it's hormonally sensitive. Most breast cancers are hormonally sensitive, Okay. So that means that all the risk factors that we talk about, you know, like having your period at an early age, having menopause late, hormonal replacement therapy, you not know, having any children, all of that are hormonally sensitive risk factors. But we don't really know much about risk factors for triple negative because it's not hormonally sensitive. So that's the challenge that we have, you know, even today in 2019, because most of the risk factors that we talk about are hormonally driven. So I guess we still have to uncap which are the risk factors for the triple negative. Yeah, so that's we what can I try think. to prevent it. Exactly. We don't we don't know. So other than knowing your family history and trying to live a healthy life and if you're in any of those categories there's nothing you can do. Yeah, you know, and I think as uh, I said, We've been seeing this in the news a lot lately, and just in the five minutes talking to you, you know, some of my questions were going to be like, why is this more prevalent among younger say? women? Or we're seeing a lot in the news of, of reasons why people think this could be more prevalent am amongst different demographic, like Hispanic women, for example, or African American or well, younger but, women. But, but we just, you know, you know, there is reasons for that. And that is because there has been such an admixture of cultures and genetic pools over time. And if you take a look, it's really fascinating when you take a look at, you know, the slaves who came from Africa, different parts of Africa, who came to the Americas, who came to the States, et cetera, et cetera. All those genes are really admixed with other cultures, okay? And hence, you know, even in the mulatto population, you see a lot of the triple negative, um, you know, because they've been a mix with the Hispanic genes, you know. So, and then you, some of those ladies came to the state, and depending upon where you came from in Africa, it's the genetic pool that you have. So it's all the mixing of genes over time. Hmm. So it's fascinating. It really is fascinating. That is fascinating. Do you feel like the patients that you've treated with triple negative breast cancer, is it more likely for that breast cancer to come back and return after being treated? Well, we know by, you know, for the follow-up, since we've been following this subtype, that we know that the women with triple negative breast cancer tend to have, tend to have a slightly higher likelihood of local recurrence, okay? How, meaning that if I offer breast conservation, that it might come back. However, having a triple negative breast cancer in the absence of a genetic mutation is not an indication for me not to offer breast conservation. As long as the patient is informed, you know, there's no reason why if you have a triple negative breast cancer, if you want to conserve your breast, that you cannot conserve your breast. That's not the case. However, if you have a genetic mutation identified with your triple negative breast cancer, that would be BRCA1, most likely, or BRCA2, or any other, that then obviously you need a mastectomy and we, we, you don't have a choice. But that's usually, there's no contraindication to breast conservation. Is there anything if you have a for those patients that might be fearful of the reoccurrence or a slightly higher reoccurrence? Yeah, they actually, a lot of these patients nowadays choose to have a mastectomy. Okay. And they choose to have the contralateral breast removed even when they don't have a genetic mutation. Just because since it's so challenging to treat it, 
they're afraid of a future recurrence. You know, that's just normal. Have I ever had patients with triple negatives who choose to conserve the breast? I have done great yet. Have I had triple negative patients who just are so refractory to treatment that they didn't make it? Absolutely. So you have both extremes. And I have to point out something. You know, triple negatives does not only occur in African-American women. It occurs in any patient. You know, I've had many Caucasian women with breast cancer, you know, with triple negative, too. So it's not just exclusive to African Americans. They just have a higher prevalence of it. Okay. That makes sense. I'm going to open it up. I've asked you a lot of questions. Let me open it up and see if my colleagues here have additional. This is great insight. And I think as I read through some of the questions that the publications might ask, your insight is, is almost kind of diving deeper into some of these misconceptions because I think we came in thinking a certain way and you've just identified some of these misconceptions and, and explained it in a way that, that makes a little bit more sense to the, you know, layman's terms. You know what, and what, is, uh, what is interesting from anybody's standpoint is, okay, is it really more aggressive or as a lot of people would postulate, is it that we don't have a specific target because they hurt to tumors that account for another 15, 20% of breast cancers. Before we had the targeted therapy, those patients had even a worse outcome than the triple negative. But then because of research, we now have a targeted therapy that has changed those patients' lives dramatically. So now they do great, okay? So are we, everybody's waiting for that, what they call the bullet for the triple negative, you know, we've tried lots and lots of different strategies and nothing has found out. I think perhaps this is the most fertile area of research in breast cancer because everybody wants to be the one to get the that perfect target for the triple negative because it affects so many women. Just to clarify some of our notes really quick, you mentioned earlier that this specific kind of breast cancer, it, it is hormonally sensitive or is it not? It is not. It, it is, is not. not. You know, by definition, you know, so again, there, when we um, diagnose breast cancer pathologically, there are three main receptors that we check for to help us better understand why it might be the biology of that specific breast cancer. Because going back to basics, breast cancers are not all the same. So you can have an invasive ductal cancer which is the one that starts in the dogs and that accounts for about 80% of breast cancers. And then you have the one that starts in the lobules that accounts for about 10 to 15% of breast cancers. And the rest are very, very, uh, very minor subtypes. But within the ductal and the lobular, then it may be estrogen, progesterone, or HER2 positive or negative. And those are the three things that we check for. What are these receptors? Receptors, if you can imagine, are kind of little antenna that live like in the uh, outer wall or the outer membrane of the cancer cell. Some of those cancer cells have those antenna and some do not. When you have a triple negative, they don't have antenna for any of the three. And then when you're hormonally sensitive, you have antenna for the estrogen or the progesterone or human or female hormones. And then the third antenna that we check for is the HER2 which is an epithelial factor that if you have it, we also have a specific target for it, okay? So the triple negative, the one that has none of the antenna, so it's on its own. And, uh, and that's they are defined at the pathologic levels. So when they look at uh, under the microscope, they do special stains, so then they can give us as clinicians all of that information. So then we can make clinical decisions that really are individualized not only to the patient but also to the tumor characteristics so we can really talk about that tailored care that we talk about that's what we talk about how can we learn more about the biology that so we can really offer something that targets the tumor cells that we're dealing with because not all breast cancers are the same and this is more of that the triple negative this did is that help Yes, this has been extremely helpful. Everybody's furiously taking notes. I think this is um, enough to gather, you know, some materials and insights to start putting some things together. 
Um, Gina, is there anything else that you want to add before we wrap up this piece? Uh, not on my end. I think okay. everything was very complete and insightful. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So, Dr. Mendez, if we can steal your time for five more minutes, I want to shift gears Absolutely. just a moment. You can have my time for any time you want. Okay. <laughs> I'm thank done with you right now. So yeah. we today have um, a reporter reached out to us from Everyday Health, and they're writing a story on genetic testing. Um, as you know, obviously, we get inundated with requests as we lead into October. Um, yeah. She had some, she's looking for experts that can provide their insight, and so we want to be able to respond to, so this is a media inquiry, um, and we will take some notes and send it back to the reporter. Okay. She's okay. Um, asking about... Um, the BRCA gene, and what do some of these genes do, and how do they impact breast cancer? So Okay. So <laughs> let me start on the basics. Okay. Is that okay? That's fine, so, yeah. So we have to put things in perspective. Remember, only 5% of women with breast cancer have a genetic mutation that is associated with their breast cancer. Most breast cancers occur sporadically meaning that nobody has it in your family, you're the first one. 10% of women with breast cancer have a family history of some sort, but they don't have an identifiable mutation or gene or anything that we can target, okay? So when we have patients in the clinic, we actually do um, what is called the family history, where we ask about any uh, history of cancers in the family, we usually ask in my practice, since I do breast, I usually ask specifically about breast cancer, ovarian, and prostate, because those are the ones that are most commonly associated with the BRCA genes. The BRCA genes are the most prevalent genes associated with breast cancer. And we also ask questions about ethnicity, because we know that certain ethnic groups are at higher incidence of genetic mutations as compared to others. And then when they tell me that, yes, somebody had breast cancer, it's not only, I have, okay, check, I have to find out who was it, if it's a first-degree relative or not, because certainly that stratifies the risk. I have to find out how old they were when they were diagnosed with cancer, because if you were diagnosed at a later age, if you're postmenopausal, you have less risk than if the person was diagnosed premenopausal or at an earlier age. So we try to put all of these things in, in perspective. And then I ask about other cancers because obviously breast cancer is associated with many genetic syndromes, and it could be associated sometimes as well with gastric cancer, with pancreatic cancer, uh, with melanoma. But the most common are the ovarian, colon, prostate. So that's why I always ask about those first. And then I start broadening to other cancers. That in my own brain, I'm kind of stratifying that individual's risk to determine whether or not I have to send that patient for genetic testing, okay, because not everybody benefits from genetic testing. So once we go through all of that information and gathering, then we make the determination if this is somebody who might benefit from genetic testing. And then once the genetic counselor is the patient, they do a whole family tree. So what I described to you for the whole genealogy tree, and then depending upon what cancers you identify in the family, uh, then they'll decide which is the best genetic test to perform or if it's needed at all based on the uh, gathering of information. And if they decide that genetic testing is needed, then sometimes also now we not only test for BRCA1 and BRCA2, so now we have what are called genetic panels. So basically from one blood test, sometimes we can check up to um, 70 genes, 120 genes, with a fraction of the cause that it was before to check for one gene. So it's really exploded. We have tons of options, but the genetic counselors are critical in helping decide, number one, who's going to benefit from testing, and once the answer is yes, what genetic panel is going to be the best one to answer the questions that we're looking for. Hmm. So the reporter also asked about other genes that might contribute. Yes. 
to impacting yeah. breast cancer. And so she listed a list, bunch. The list, the list is endless. You know, you know, P53. Um, yeah. See, uh, we have a P53 ATM a mutation. Uh, you know, P10. the P10 mutation. Yeah. P10 and 12. You know, there's many. The list continues to grow. But most a caveat is that some of the genetic mutations are actionable and some are not. So when we do genetic testing, we have to find out which are the ones that are actionable. Because even if you have a mutation, if it's what's called a BUS or variant of unknown significance, we don't need to do anything. Okay, we just have to observe you, monitor you, but it's not actionable. And I've actually had some patients being sent in the past who they had a variant of unknown significance, and I had nothing to do for them. Hmm. To answer one of your other questions before, why is it important to know whether you have a gene or not? Because if it's actionable, then I'm going to need to talk to you about prophylactic surgery, and depending upon which is the gene that you have identified, prevention strategy. For example, somebody like Angelina Jolie. Her mother had ovarian cancer. She had the BRCA mutation. She elected to undergo prophylactic surgery for her breast and prophylactic surgery for her ovary. Okay, so if I had been her sister, I would have been tested. And had I been positive, that's something that I could have done as well. What did okay, you, because I like the term that you use. What did you say, proactive Yeah. treatment? Or what did you yeah. say, proactive uh, or You know what, so... Yes, so once you know you have a gene, I've had patients then get the, the information and then they get uh, the genetic counselors and the geneticists are really good about explaining to them what are the different risks in terms of developing X cancers, you know, over their lifetime. And then it is up to me as the patient to either be proactive and do prophylactic strategies, anything from increased surveillance to let it be, to having prophylactic surgical procedures performed. And, you know, the gamut is really broad, but it all depends upon my anxiety level, my risk, and what I want to do in my life. Have I had patients with BRCA mutation that have decided to be observed and they just have increased surveillance? Absolutely. Have I had some who decided that they wanted to have the prophylactic surgeries recommended? Absolutely. And have I had patients who have decided not to share the information with their family, even though they're positive, so that then my sister doesn't know about it? I had that too. So it's really interesting. Hmm. <laughs> so imagine, you have, I have a gene, and I opted knowingly not to tell my sister so that she can get tested. That's me. And there's nothing I can do as a clinician because of HEPA. Oh, wow. That's tough. Okay. So even if I know you have a sister and I know you have the gene, if you as the patient decide not to share that information and you tell the genetic counselor no, because usually the genetic counselors then test the additional family members right. if a um, mutation is identified. So then everybody can benefit from the information, right? So I had a patient once who decided no, and she had three sisters. And she often not to share the information with her sisters. That seems crazy to me, but yeah. I know, I mean, but that's, that's, the, that's autonomy. That's yeah. autonomy and that's HIPAA and it's, it's patient choice. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of the time when you have one of these genetic mutations, you know, it can cause a lot of uh, psychological anguish for some patients. So, you know, there's psychological component knowing that you have something uh, and also in women who have it, they're fear that their kids will have it and they feel like this guilt. So it's nobody's fault, right? So it's a very interesting set of uh, issues that you have to deal with in genetic counseling. So that's why usually before testing, the patients require counseling. And then once the results become available, they require counseling as well to put the results in perspective. Hmm. Now I understand the role of all of our genetic counselors so much more now. <laughs> I know they're invaluable. They are so invaluable. 
And, uh, you know, and the thing is that we continue to learn so much more about our genetic makeup after the Human Genome Project. There's been an explosion of genetic information, and also these genetic panels went wild. You know, just to give you an example, in 2000, I think it was 14, 15, before Angelina Jolie went public, to just to get tested for the BRCA gene, you had to pay $3,500, okay, just for that alone. If you were an Ashkenazi Jewish patient, as is, they have three founder mutations, uh, you could pay $800 and you could get testing done, okay? And everything else was, would take forever and it was very difficult and it would take a long time. Nowadays, for $200, you can get tested for up to 100 genes. I haven't been tested. Dollars. You're making me want to go get tested, Dr. Mendes. <laughs> oh, no. No, it's not necessary. Not everybody is a good candidate, but certainly once we identify those risk factors, yeah. and again, once you get counseled and once you decide whether it's something that is going to be important for you, for you or not, you know, now we have the resources and the technology to make it happen, which is the beauty of it. Yeah. But not everybody's a good candidate for testing. Absolutely not. So I think this covers what this specific reporter had in mind in terms of the, the specific genes. Gina, from your end, who's talking to the publication, is there anything else that you think that the reporter might need for this article? Yeah. If we could, if, if there's time and we could maybe just go through beyond the BCRA for a specific example, like for the TP53 gene or the ATM, uh, yeah. how these genes can like interact and cause potential breast cancer? Well, no, they're all part of breast cancer syndrome. It's just all these genes, okay. and breast cancer is a part of it. But what differs is we share the other cancers associated with the syndrome that we might try to prevent. So, for example, with the P53, you also have associated colon cancer, and you have associated um, sarcomas, uh, so that obviously 